I'm going to give, a, give you an overview of the work that was accomplished by the Consortium for the Molecular Engineering of Dispersion Systems, also known as CMEDS. Um, by its very name, um, we have been working on uh, things at the molecular level and at the nanoscale level. We have, um, it's, let me give you a little bit of a background of the group. Um, if I were to, it's a, it was a large consortium of, uh, started with 22 institutions, but with people moving around, it went to 24 institutions. Um, about uh, 43 investigators altogether. Um, but um, when you work in teams, there were maybe around 30 projects. Um, they were all connected, and I'll give you an outline of how the, the different areas that we looked at, but essentially the group of researchers was made up of chemists, physicists, chemical engineers, and environmental engineers, and the objective of what we tried to do was to look at, uh, um, to develop basic science that can be um, translated to applications in oil spills. We really wanted to understand what, how dispersants worked and uh, do long range work to hopefully develop the next generation of dispersants, um, try to translate this to, to industrial practice and uh, uh, accompanying that uh, to also work on uh, workforce development, uh, providing opportunities for students and to do research and, uh, and to do outreach activities that'll be of service to communities in the nation. Okay. All right, so um, give you a little bit of a background of the technical work. Um, uh, CMED's research uh, has led to over 80 publications. These are all journal publications. Um, and since we are in, um, in the business of also trying to develop um, new c kinds of dispersants, um, uh, there were five patent applications, not yet realized into full patents, but provisional applications at this point, okay? So um, the whole idea was can we try to, are there new classes of environmentally benign dispersants uh, that could be developed based on um, innocuous materials like biopolymers, biosurfactants, um, and what we call interfacially stabilized particles? What is really happening at the oil water interface? Can we use uh, new scientific tools to understand these better? And uh, I think a distinctive part of, uh, of CMED's work was the use of uh, molecular dynamics and chemical physics. Chem chemical simulations of molecules at an oil water interface to try to understand better what's going on. So with that background, I will give you a little bit of, uh, um, uh, of what we've accomplished in the last three years. In a broad range, we, we, talked, we worked on new dispersion concepts. Um, tied to that was a little better understanding of the science of current dispersants. And then we had some aspects of face, fate and transport. And I want to emphasize that uh, uh, the, what I tried to do was I, I went out to the entire consortium and asked everyone to prepare a slide that will talk about uh, project ob objectives and relevance and what their key findings were. Um, and even though I don't have the time to go through all of them, uh, and, and I have a, uh, put, put in names there. The understanding is that these were not, these are not things done in isolation. These are projects that there was constant back and forth, small teams together. For example, if we talk about Srini Raghavan's work on, on, on these new kinds of, of emulsions, there were four or five other investigators who, who worked with him and um, who published with him. Okay, so uh, to some degree, uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a very broad way, this might be, um, I've, I've kind of highlighted this as a, as, a, as a technology that was developed primarily through Srini Raghavan, where the DOS component of Corexit can be substituted, hopefully, for something like lecithin, which is a phospholipid. It's got obtained from soybeans. 
Uh, it has this chemical structure that is not too dissimilar from DOS. And what Srini has found is that uh, when you mix it in by itself, lecithin is not a very good dispersant, but when you mix it in with some of the other components of Corexit, the, the non-ionic surfactants, uh, this becomes an extremely good uh, emulsifier and potentially a dispersant. Uh, lecithin is, is uh, phospholipids are it's entirely innocuous, uh, hopefully. Um, again, everything depends on the dosage. Um, but the idea here is now to understand how exactly this works. Um, and uh, he's published a paper on this. And to, to try to translate this. And uh, we've been very grateful to uh, um, the API who have uh, um, come forth and have asked Srini whether they can test out these, these new dispersants in their larger scale tests. So the other thing that I want to bring up is the fact that this is all laboratory-based research uh, with, with, with scientists working in the lab entirely, OK? Um, Another class of, of dispersants is uh, uh, perhaps headed by uh, the University of South Florida, where they've found that cactus mucilage, uh, again, a biologically a biopolymer, is capable of, of doing a great job in, in stabilizing emulsion droplets. Um, Another interesting uh, uh, aspect that, I, that I'd like to dwell a little, little bit on is this concept of uh, chemical herding, um, where when you have when you're out in the in the ocean and you have oil and it spreads and it spreads because if you look at uh, this particular thing, unfortunately the the projector is not strong enough, I guess, and it's very hard to see these these details here. Um, but when, if you take a drop of oil and you put it on water, you can see that it spreads extremely fast because of the balance of, of forces that, that, that lead to the, the, the force along the oil water, uh, the, the water air direction being greater than the sum that tend to make it contract. So the oil spreads. Um, it's, a, it's called the spreading pressure concepts. Um, what is done is you apply a herder, uh, which is basically an, an amphiphile, a surfactant, that lowers the, the, um, the water-air uh, surface tension. And as a consequence, it, it causes this drop to retract and become a thick mass. Over here, what you see is the, the thickness of the, of the oil uh, uh, increasing with time upon application of the herder. What you see here is the herder being applied, and eventually these things become a compact mass. And then if you're out in the ocean, one of the practices is, is, is to, to, to be able to burn it, or perhaps to, to pick it up, to use skimming to, to recover it. Okay. Uh, what George Down uh, has done, again, in collaboration with others in CMEDS, is to develop these herders, which are now currently siloxane-based herders, which persist in the environment. Okay, uh, he's, he's been able to, to uh, transition from there to a plant-based, uh, biologically-based herder that, has, that seems to have the same kind of uh, efficiency as the siloxane-based herders. It's extremely effective. And the primary advantage of this, this material is that once it, it biodegrades, and so it's, it's, it, it's, it's lost uh, in a reasonably short period of time. So, so there's synthetic chemistry involved uh, and colloidal chemistry involved in trying to understand how these things work and the design of these materials. Uh, then there's this, the concept of particles at interface, um, which is very, very um, uh, relevant to the, the oil mineral um, uh, aggregates that have been found. Um, but we take a little bit of a different spin on it. We design particles that will stick to the oil-water interface and stabilize it. And in the process, the hope is that we need much less dispersant, that uh, you can actually prevent oil from coalescing and spreading on the surface. In a sense, you can think of uh, these oil marbles, perhaps, floating on the, on, on the surface. They do not spread, and uh, 
they, they can be, uh, the, uh, due to surface convection effects, they can be dispersed over a large range and, and they can be photodegraded and so on. Um, this is some, some work that has pr primarily come out of, of Brown University, where his, uh, um, Bob Hurt has shown that uh, uh, there are two classes of materials. These are, these are carbon-based materials, carbon black particles. Uh, and then these are the clays and in the, in the extreme uh, carbon nanosheets, the graphene type materials, which are not practical at this, uh, at this point in time. But clays are, uh, sheet-like clays are very, very easily available. And what he's trying to say is that you can armor uh, droplets uh, against coalescence by having these clays that absorb on the oil water interface, prevent oil from aggregating and coalescing to, and spreading and, and making it easier to be dispersed or to be picked up. Okay. The bottom line, Agnes Kane is, is, was one of the few toxicologists in the, in, in, in the consortium. She shows that some of these materials are, are, um, are innocuous to, to organisms like Artemia franciscana. Um, extending on this, uh, extending on this concept, um, we have uh, used a different kind of clays. These are tubular clays. Okay, the tubal the, the tubular clays they're known as halicite, and you can get them in large tonnage quantities. They they have the inner lumen can be filled with with the surfactant components of of corexit or any other dispersant. Okay, so you have a controlled delivery of these these dispersants. The clays stick to the oil water interface and then release the surfactant cargo. And as the, you release the surfactant cargo, the droplets become much smaller. And you're able to, and this is an electron micrograph of uh, clay sticking and how they form networks on an oil droplet. The idea is that, again, you can minimize the use of solvent. You can minimize the use of dispersant. You can target uh, 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 dispersant to the oil. And uh, um, basically uh, improve the efficiency of dispersant use. A very similar concept here is the use of uh, biopolymers that are slightly modified. And here we use things like chitosan and alginates that basically tie up oil droplets. So this is the reverse of dispersion. This is taking oil, tying it up into a con compact mass that allows it to be burnt or picked up. All right. Um, I'll, I'll then switch to a few examples of uh, uh, underlying signs of current dispersants. This is, this is perhaps a, uh, um, an interesting observation that has come out from the Carnegie Mellon group. And it's really, this is, this is to understand how the components of Corexit behave. What uh, Lynn Walker and Shelly Anna at Carnegie Mellon have done is that they, they take model components of, of, of Corexit, in this particular case, the tweens. What they're showing here is that uh, you, if, you, if you add tween and the surface tension, the interfacial tension goes down, and then you remove the tween from the bulk, Okay, the, the tr traditional concept is that eventually the, the surfactants will come off the interface uh, because there's always a partitioning between a surfactant uh, in, the, in the oil water interface and in the bulk. And, and people have been saying in the wide open ocean where it's infinitely dilute, the surfactant will come off. Uh, what Linus and, and Shelley have shown is that with tween, it really doesn't come off. The interfacial tension drops, and when they rinse it, 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 it doesn't come off at all. The interfacial tension stays, stays down below. And then when you start adding aliquots of DOS, and then you start rinsing it again, and you see that the DOS comes off, but the tween stays at the interface, which is, an, which is counterintuitive. Uh, the, there are classes of uh, dispersants that become irreversibly absorbed at the oil-water interface. Okay? And, and uh, uh, this is where the molecular simulations have actually helped. Uh, Ron Larson at the, at, at the University of Michigan has worked in close collaboration with Shelly Anna and Lynn Walker. And he, seems, and he shows that there's a crowding of the tween at the interface. And because of the molecular structure of, of, of the tween, it's not easy for it to come off the, the interface. All right. Um, in, in, a, in a similar way, uh, understanding individual co 
components of dispersants, um, how each of them contribute to lowering the, the, the interfacial tension, um, and, and how, what, what is, uh, why, what's the mixture of these things that, that, are, that is extremely efficient. Um, that's work that, that has been accomplished, okay? And then the last aspect of this, the, the last aspect of this that I want to briefly touch about is uh, uh, collaborative work, again, that has been done on fate and transport. Um, this is some work that has shown that when you have a spill and even breaking waves or gas effluence, uh, you create these, these bubbles that uh, basically create an aerosol uh, from the plume, and the aerosol becomes transported over distances. And uh, KT Valsaraj has, has shown that uh, um, the, there, there's a number of particulate matter, uh, the, the heavier hydrocarbons, it's kind of intuitive, the heavier hydrocarbons seem to be carried much better at the oil-water interface, so do the components of the, of the dispersants. If you have dispersants in there, at the same time, the, some of the dispersants also get entrapped in the aerosol droplets, okay? Uh, and I want to, again, bring about that there's a whole range from a very applied perspective. I want to show the, the range of work that, that CMETS has done. This is a very applied perspective from the university, uh, from Flor Florida International University, Berin Tansel. She's shown, she takes man the mangrove uh, roots and she shows how they become oiled and how the oil penetrates into them. Um, to, um, Understanding photodegradation of dispersants. Um, Carl Linden at, at the University of Colorado. So you're getting more fundamental. Carl finds that uh, uh, dispersant components also get get broken up by by the sunlight, and and he's doing very very detailed analysis of the components that have been that that are evolved upon by upon photocatalytic degradation to very, very fundamental aspects of, of what is going on here um, in terms of, again, oil mass, uh, the fate and transport of what happens when you have mineral aggregates at an oil water interface. Uh, this is very fundamental work um, from the University of Massachusetts showing that uh, uh, when you have particles at an oil water interface, how the oil detaches off, how, the f how strongly bound are the particles, how the shape of the particles affects the ability of particles to stick at an oil water interface uh, leads to a better understanding of oil mineral aggregates, leads to a better understanding of how um, um, uh, bioorganisms adsorb or, or, or grow biofilm, um, the, the marine snow aspects, and so on. Um, and finally, I will end with a very fundamental example from Noshir Pasika that, that's talking about how oil comes and adsorbs on a surface. And what he's, tr what he's saying is that it depends on the roughness of a surface. If you have a flat surface, there's a lower contact angle for the oil to adsorb, which means oil spreads on a surface. The same surface, if you have a degree of roughness, undulations on the surface, the, the contact angle becomes much larger. Uh, this is a fundamental uh, concept called the Casey-Baxter uh, theory, and uh, he's now examining different different um, surfaces of, uh, of plants and so on to try to correlate surface roughness to the wettability of oil on these, these materials. So this is, this is a fundamental work. It ranges from new dispersants to understanding current dispersants to the fate and transport all on a molecular scale. And I would like to end by uh, saying that all the investigators in CMEDS f have felt that this is a wonderful opportunity that they've had to do uh, the work that they wanted to, uh, to, to carry out basic research on dispersants and oil spill remediation. And we're all very grateful to, the, to, to Gomri for this opportunity. Thank you very much.